There are many players in the fashion industry, but few of them have accomplished what the famous Dior has accomplished. Today, the Dior fashion empire is worth over $6 billion. The company employs about 150,000 people in its 210 stores across the globe. So how did Dior become the huge success it is today? And how did the company go from a small town in France to reaching the other side of the world? Well, it all started with a man named Christian Dior. Born in the lowly town of Granville in Normandy, France, Christian Dior had a dream to build a fashion empire. The task was never going to be easy as he was born in post-World War I France. Plus, he would face huge competition from industry giants like Coco Chanel, just to name a few. There was even the outbreak of World War II, which stunted the national and global economy. But these were not enough to stop the brave Christian Dior. He knew that he would be able to achieve his dreams if he worked hard at them, and that no obstacle was big enough to stop him. As a result, he built one of the largest fashion empires the world has ever seen. Even though he didn't live up to the age of 60, he was able to put his fashion empire on the global map. Now, let's take a deeper look at how it all began. Christian Dior was born on the 21st of January, 1905, in the small town of Granville, on the coastal town of Normandy, France. His father was Maurice Dior, a wealthy fertilizer manufacturer who ran the Dior Frere business, while his mother was Madeline Martin. Christian was the second of seven children. As a child, he had a deep passion for art. He would regularly lock himself in a room and sketch fashion designs. Later on, he would sell his fashion pieces for 10 cents a piece. From a very young age, Dior was already honing his entrepreneurship skills. His parents wanted him to become a diplomat, but his heart lay in art. At the age of 23, Dior was already tired of school and wanted to pursue his passion for art. With the support of his parents, he quit school and opened a small art gallery. Most of the money came from his father, who was supportive even though he wanted his son to become a diplomat. Things were going well for the young Christian Dior. He was selling his designs, and money was rolling in. Life couldn't be better for Dior, but all that was about to change. The next three years saw Christian Dior go through a series of heartbreaking challenges that would test his character. First of all, he lost his mother and his brother. Then the Great Depression hit, and his father lost control of the family business. As a result, he had to close down his art gallery. For a young Christian Dior, this was a major fork in the road, but he wouldn't give up on his dream. Christian picked himself up after the closure of his art gallery and started looking for employment. His luck improved when he was hired by the famous fashion designer, Robert Puget. Puget gave Dior a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to design three Puget collections. Dior did his best and nailed the opportunity. As a result, Piget kept Dior. This was a great opportunity for Dior as he met the famous Pierre Balmain through Piget. Dior even credited his job with Piget for teaching him the virtues of simplicity through which elegance must come. Dior's time with Piget was about to come to an end as the next major tragedy would soon strike. By 1939, the Second World War had started, so citizens were being called up to fight for their nations. Dior was no exception, as he was soon called up to join the French army. Two years later, he left, and now had to rebuild himself again. This he did when he joined a famous fashion house owned by Lucien Lelong. There he met Belmain again, and both were the primary designers of the fashion house. At this time, France had surrendered to Germany, so Dior faced a problem. He wanted to preserve the fashion industry in France, mainly because of artistic and economic reasons. This led to Dior working for the Nazi army, designing clothes for the wives of the Nazi officers and the French soldiers collaborating with them. This was the same tactic used by other fashion houses, and it kept them in business during the course of the war. During this time, Dior faced another tragedy. His sister, Catherine, joined the French resistance, and she was captured by the German secret police, otherwise known as the Gestapo. The German army took her to a concentration camp, and she remained there until the end of the war in 1945. Her release made Dior so happy that he dedicated his first ever fragrance, Miss Dior. 
to his sister two years later. After working at multiple fashion houses over the years, Dior was now ready to do his own thing. The war was over, and normal life was beginning to return, and so businesses began to open again. By 1948, Dior had established his perfume company. A year later, he launched his second fragrance, Diorama. This was to be followed by two more releases in 1953 and the other in 1956. One day, back in the late 1940s, Dior received an invite from a very wealthy entrepreneur. This man wanted Dior to design for his fashion house named Philippe et Gaston. This man was also known as the richest man in France, so that Dior would have been very well paid. To the man's surprise, Dior turned down the offer. He told the man that he would instead work for a brand under his name rather than try to revive an old brand, even if that meant he would be starting from scratch. Dior left the man disappointed. Dior was upbeat, however, knowing that it wouldn't be long before he opened his own fashion house. And indeed, it wasn't long after. On the 8th of December, 1946, Christian Dior launched his fashion house. He received financial backing from a man named Boussac. Dior presented his first collection about three months later. The collection was named Corel, French, for a circlet of flower petals. While the look wasn't exactly new, it was very different from what was available in Paris at the time. As a result, the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar, Carmel Snow, called the collection the new look. What made his clothes stand out was how he designed the waist area. He usually added padding or corsets to the waist, and it made the dress flare out at the waist region, giving the models a curvy look. Of course, there was some backlash from women who felt his dress covered up too much of their legs. Some people also complained that he used too much fabric in one dress. Most of the backlash was being fueled by a rival who owned a giant fashion house, Coco Chanel, of the famous House of Chanel. The backlash was reduced as the world recovered from shortages caused by the war. Soon, the new look, as his style was called, became the flagship of fashion at that time. The new look became so popular that it restored Paris to the position of fashion capital of the world. Dior's designs were so good that Carmel Snow told him, It's quite a revolution, dear Christian. Your dresses have such a new look. Apparently, this was the mood of many people in Paris at the time. Dior had become so popular that his rival, Coco Chanel, had to step out of retirement to counter the rise of Dior products. Chanel furiously attacked Dior and his fashion style, saying, Look how ridiculous these women are. Wearing clothes by a man who doesn't know women, never had one and dreams of being one. Dior doesn't dress women, he upholsters them. Of course, Dior didn't see things this way. When asked about his fashion style, he simply said, I think of my work as ephemeral architecture, dedicated to the beauty of the female body. Sadly, Chanel's view of Dior's work was popular in the US. When he visited in 1947, he was met with demonstrators who were waving placards and telling him to go home. Dior remained undaunted. He wanted to open a store in America, and he knew it would take a lot. When reminiscing on his adventures in America, he had this to say, I knew that if I wanted to reach a large number of elegant American women, I had to open a luxury ready-to-wear shop in New York. He wanted to build a global fashion brand, so he traveled around the world with that aim in mind. He opened his first subsidiary store at number 745 on Fifth Avenue a year later. In 1953, he opened his first South American store in Caracas, Venezuela. By the following year, he had opened his first store in London. The trend continued like this. He opened stores in Australia, Cuba, Mexico, and Chile. Dior also added other products over the years, including lipsticks, stockings, gloves, and jewelry. Dior used a very brilliant marketing strategy. He used little indirect advertising, but had excellent relations with the press. This made both him and his store very popular. He even designed clothes for Hollywood. In 1955, he was nominated for the 1955 Academy Award for Best Costume Design. He was also nominated for a BAFTA and a Caesar Award. By 1955, 
Dior had over a thousand employees, working in 28 stores. Dior was also responsible for exporting half of all French fashion exports. Things were going well for Christian Dior until the final tragedy struck. Two years after being nominated for an Oscar, the fashion designer passed away. He was only 52 at the time, and he was playing a game of cards with friends when he had a heart attack. Christian Dior is a man who had passed through many difficulties on his way to success. His father lost the family business, and as a result, the family was left poor. This didn't deter Dior's ambition, and soon he joined a fashion house. Things were on the up again, but then the Second World War broke out, and Dior had to leave fashion once again. He returned from the army and went back into fashion. As a result of this kind of perseverance, Dior built one of the largest fashion brands in just under 30 years. Sadly, the man lived a relatively short life. Who knows what he could have achieved if he had 20 more years? That's the end of today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. If you did, let us know by liking the video. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss out on inspiring videos like these.